So for the first time ever, I am doing a signature edition of History Hunters in my car. What did you do when you were 12 years old? Probably out playing, kicking the ball around, riding bicycles, harassing your brother and sister. Well, I maybe did some of that, but I also wrote to celebrities and I was really hooked at a young age. Uh, to get autographs and the way that I got them was I wrote to celebrities. It was real simple You just had to find the address which was usually available at the local library Who's who in America had addresses listed there were some other sources as well and the people that I enjoyed writing to were senators and governors and Some occasional movie stars. I found out that William Nolan who was a former US senator. He was living. He was a publisher of the Oakland Tribune newspaper. So I decided to write to him at his office at the Oakland Tribune. One of the things that I would do was a little trick. I would ask the celebrity to tell me who their favorite uh, president was and why. Also, another thing that I would ask him is, what makes a great American? Maybe it sounds corny, but got responses from a lot of celebrities. So on February 8th, 1974, I got a letter from William Nolan. So he, he wrote me, he told me that George Washington was his favorite president. I was pretty proud of that letter. In fact, I would take it around, show my parents, I showed probably my brothers too. And I would pull it out a lot and look at it. About uh, two weeks later, my mother brings me a copy of the Modesto B. actually on the front page. I still have the clippings from it. Senator Nolan killed himself. And needless to say, I was beyond shock because I would look at that letter thinking, okay, the hand that signed that letter just pulled the trigger and ended his life. Totally shocked. I still have a letter. I'll tell you about it on this episode of History Hunters. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and read uh, just maybe the fourth paragraph. Uh, he talks about what a pleasure it was to hear from somebody 12 years of age in the seventh grade. Obviously, I had said that I wanted to be a lawyer because that's what I thought you needed to do to enter politics, and I wanted to enter politics, and uh, that didn't happen. But in the fourth paragraph, he says, in answer to your final question, I picked George Washington, who was not only our first president, but who had the great responsibility of helping to draft the Constitution of the United States, and then became the first president to make what was a new form of government operate successfully. He had no president to guide him in the decisions that he had to make, but the firm foundation that he has left has permitted this nation to grow from a small country of 13 million people in the 13 original states to a great nation which now consists of 50 states in the Union. With my very best personal regards to you and again wishing you success in both your schoolwork and future activities, I remain sincerely yours, William F. Nolan. And there at the bottom, leaning far to the right, is his illegible signature. I often had looked at that signature wondering if I could see any kind of suicidal tendencies in it. William Nolan was groomed by his father, the owner of the Tribune, to be President of the United States, but he fell short of the mark. In the end, he was a defeated man burdened with debt and a messy private life, running the family newspaper into the ground. When he wrote to me, the 65-year-old Nolan was deeply in debt from gambling losses and pressures from mobsters and began to obsess with death. On February 21st, Mr. Nolan was in an ebullient mood as he greeted well-wishers on the occasion of the Oakland Tribune's 100th birthday celebration. Governor Ronald Reagan dropped by and praised Nolan for his integrity and the Tribune's objective reporting. Two days later, on February 23, 1974, Nolan decided to end it all at a summer home in Guerneville. Nolan was the son of a congressman and by 25 he had become California's youngest state assemblyman. From then until he lost the race for governor to Edmund G. Brown in 1958, Mr. Nolan became known as a fast-rising politician in the Republican Party. Mr. Nolan attained the rank of a major as a civil affairs officer and military historian in World War II. He was serving in Europe when he reportedly first learned from an article in Stars and Stripes magazine that he had been appointed to the Senate. In 1945, at the age of 37, he became the youngest member of the U.S. Senate when he was appointed to fill out an unexpired term after the death of Senator Hiram Johnson. When Richard Nixon was overcome with emotion after hearing that Eisenhower responded favorably to his famous Chicker speech and wouldn't dump him from the 1952 ticket, it was on Nolan's shoulders that he cried, literally. 
When Dwight Eisenhower was inaugurated president on January 20th, 1953, Nolan was selected to deliver the oath of office to Vice President Richard Nixon. This happened despite Nolan's long-running battle with fellow Senator Nixon for influence in state Republican Party affairs. When Eisenhower was inaugurated again four years later in 1957, Nolan, seen here behind Nixon listening to the beautiful singing voice of Marian Anderson, delivered the second oath of office to the vice president. The contempt that Nixon had for Nolan surfaced in 1968 when Nixon came across the Bay Bridge from San Francisco to Oakland and one aide pointed out the Oakland Tribune Tower. Nixon replied, bastard. A fierce anti-communist, Nolan strongly supported Chiang Kai-shek's Nationalist China, but his most notable accomplishment came with the floor management of the Civil Rights Act of 1957. Nolan and Senator Lyndon Johnson crafted and passed in the Senate the watered-down version of the Civil Rights Act, the first such law since Reconstruction. After the bill was passed, Nolan wept because of the bill's perceived weakness in protecting civil rights. In 1963, President Kennedy asked Congress for a comprehensive civil rights bill. At the time of Kennedy's tragic murder that November, Congress and the Senate were already working on legislation with Bill Nolan as an instrumental leader. On February 10, 1964, the House voted to approve the Civil Rights Act of 1964, with 138 Republicans helping to pass the bill. Uh, Senator Nolan, what is your timetable now in, regarding the Civil Rights Bill? I still believe that we have... Uh several weeks of debate left before an effective civil rights bill is finally passed by the Senate. After we dispose of the current amendments, the major fight will come on Section 4. I hope and expect that Section 4 will be retained as it passed by the House and without any uh, crippling amendments. On February 10, 1964, the House of Representatives voted 290 to 130 to approve the Civil Rights Act of 1964, with 138 Republicans helping to pass the bill. Nolan, a 200-pound, six-foot-tall man, was known throughout his life more for his determination than his finesse. In the Senate, his ways were once described as, quote, subtle as a Sherman tank, a little unseeing and rough, but he gets there. In 1954, when Senator Nolan thought the Eisenhower administration showed signs of weakening in its opposition to the admission of communist China to the United Nations, he threatened to resign and stump the country in an effort to force the United States to resign from the United Nations. His popularity led him toward the presidential arena, and before President Eisenhower announced his intentions to seek re-election in 1956, Senator Nolan's name had been entered into several state primaries, but he withdrew as soon as it became apparent that Eisenhower would run again. In 1958, he signaled his intentions to run for president in 1960, and he declined to run for re-election to the Senate, instead challenging Governor Goodwin Knight in the Republican gubernatorial primary. Although California today is considered solidly democratic, in the 1950s it was a Republican stronghold. That all changed with a gubernatorial election of 1958, when it experienced a crushing defeat. In 1958, two of California's most powerful Republicans tried to switch jobs. Governor Goodwin Knight ran for a U.S. Senate seat, while Senator Nolan tried to be elected governor. Nolan wanted to be president and didn't believe he could be elected from the Senate, so his ambition drove him to run for governor, even against Knight, the well-liked governor of his own party. The epic failure of the big switch opened the door for an ambitious San Francisco Democrat named Edmund G. Pat Brown, who seized the moment to change the political narrative in California. Nolan's strategy was to defeat the moderate Goodwin Knight, move the party to the right, establish himself as the state's favorite son, and thwart the presidential ambitions of another California Republican, Vice President Richard Nixon. Though Democrats were dismayed when Knight pulled out of the race and Republicans avoided a bitter primary fight, the big switch turned into a fiasco for the Republicans. Knight was treated so shabbily that Republicans abandoned Nolan in disgust, and the beneficiary was Pat Brown. Nolan also probably lost because he rejected moderate republicanism and campaigned on an anti-labor platform. In California, Governor Goodwin J. Knight, trying for the Senate seat, is stopped short of the goal by a flood tide of Democratic votes. Also halted is Senator William F. Nolan, GOP candidate for Governor of California, losing to Edmund G. Pat Brown, the state's Attorney General. After the 1950 election, neither Nolan or Knight would again hold public office. 
Although he served as a member of the Goldwater Campaign Committee in 1964 and was a delegate to the 1968 Republican National Convention, Nolan largely retired from active political life after his 1958 defeat and devoted himself increasingly to the newspaper. He became president and editor of the Tribune after the death of his father in 1966 and began to take an active part in local affairs. His participation and the support of the Tribune have been credited for the success of such projects as the Oakland Coliseum Complex, the Oakland Museums Complex, and the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, otherwise known as BART. As the editor of the newspaper during the years of rising racial strife, Mr. Nolan spoke out against the Black Panthers movement and led a successful fight against a boycott called by some blacks against Oakland grocery stores. In one side editorial, Mr. Nolan offered a $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of those who murdered Dr. Marcus A. Foster, the city's first black school superintendent. His 47-year marriage to his childhood sweetheart, they met when they were in the sixth grade, ended in divorce in 1972. Later that year, he married Ann Dixon of Tulsa, Oklahoma in a Las Vegas ceremony. Early in 1973, Mr. Nolan filed for a divorce. In 1974, Nolan was a defeated man. His personal life was in shambles. His marriage to Anne was a huge mistake. Heavy gambling and his new wife's extravagant spending habits took all of his money. He died owing over $900,000 to banks and impatient Las Vegas mobsters, the equivalent of about $4.95 million in 2021. On February 22, 1974, a depressed and troubled Nolan left Oakland and drove to his summer home in Guerneville. The next day, he walked outside, stood at the edge of the Russian River, and took his own life with the help of a 32 caliber Colt. He was 65. Nolan's remains share an unbefitting niche in a mausoleum of the Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland with that of his first wife, Helen Nolan White, and her mother, Estelle Davis Herrick.